I'm not a professional writer, novelist, or author in any way, shape, or form. This novelization may contain grammatical errors and dialogue inconsistencies that conflict with the original source material. I'm also not a professional voice actor or reading specialist. I did the best I could and kept the best takes. This is really just for the enjoyment of fans of the original source material and curious people. This work is technically classified as fan fiction and greatly expands upon the original source material. Please enjoy and support the official release. Chapter 3 The Larceny of Men Get out of here, you drunken bastard! shouted a gruff voice as what looked like a grown man was being thrown out of the front door of a local pub. As he stumbles down a flight of stone steps and falls onto the ground, soft grunts of pain call out as he lands in the middle of the stone street. The door to the pub slams shut as rain falls from the overcast sky and onto the ground as the street itself was drenched in water and splatted with mud. The street was a bit busy as people walked by only stared for a moment a social pause in time, and then went back to their own business. As the young man slowly rose to his feet, he took a quick look around as he began to casually walk away from the bar as if nothing peculiar took place. He was a tall and almost lanky individual. He wore a simple white shirt that was covered up mostly by a grass-green sleeveless surcoat, where the bottom tips of the coat only reached down to his mid-thighs. It seemed almost self-made as the coat was cut down the middle and had a few pieces of string tied to wooden knobs to keep the coat closed. It also had a lapel around the neck that was flared up and not folded back, slightly covering the sides of his face when seen from the profile. His wrists were wrapped in green and turquoise straps of cloth, and a turquoise and sky bluish bandana was wrapped around his neck. He wore a green skull cap on his head, with a light blue and turquoise striped lapel at the base of the skull cap that covered the entire crown of his head. The surcoat was also supported by a leather belt with a large dagger sheathed on it, and a pair of turquoise and blue sashes wrapped around the belt, with a sash ends trailing down the side of his left leg. He also had on simple brown boots and a set of tanned leather pants covering his legs. Several strands of blonde hair from his bangs stuck out from the bottom of the bandana covering his head, along with other various strands of hair sticking out of the back and covering some of his neck. His skin was mocha in color, and his face was very refined and soft. He was dashing and handsome, as many of the women traversing the busy pathway took a moment to look at him, sometimes giggling bashfully at the sight of him. He had a well-balanced thin nose and thin brown eyes. His smile was filled with shining pearl-white teeth as he held a suave expression on his face as a whole. He reached into his surcoat to find several hidden pockets, some with thin steel throwing knives in them, as he reached into one near his left breast. Upon removing his hand from his coat, he pulls out what appears to be a small roll of parchment paper as he takes a moment to look around and see if anyone suspicious outside of himself is watching. He sees an alley between what looked like a weaponsmith shop and a black magus codices supply store, where he took shelter from the rain. He was very cautious, however, before opening the scroll to make sure the alley was clear of any riffraff. Once he felt secure, he let out a confident snicker as he unrolled the scroll to observe what was written upon it. It looked like a manifest to a ship that listed various contents that were stored, though at the very top of the page there was a title specific for this ledger that spelled out PLUNDER. As he took a gander through the different items listed, he, at times, would let out a soft chortle, finding some of the items to be less than worthwhile. He knew that times were tough on people all over the world, and so there is less to steal when everyone you're stealing from is broke, but still, this manifest of plunder looked a bit shameful in his eyes. He did, however, take note at some entries near the bottom of the manifest that seemed to catch his attention. Lufinian gold, mithril rings and jewelry, silver statues, gems of sapphire, ruby, diamond, opal, a, a, a black crystal? The young man says, his whispering voice trailing up in pitch as he finds one of the entries to be a bit strange. Never heard of a black crystal before. Well, 
still. Interesting little relics they have here. They must have found some ruins of a lost civilization or something to find these kinds of treasures. He takes a quick moment to look around again, almost seeming mildly paranoid, as he then folds the scroll up and places the scroll in a small leather pouch stitched to the back of his leather belt. He buckles the pouch closed with a simple brass buckle and leather strap as he leans against the wall of the alley. Since these fools think they're so smart, I guess I could lighten their load a bit, since they are the only people with any money in this damn town. Who would have thought pirates would take up residence here anyway? Kind of strange if you ask me. The man says as he pushes himself off the wall and then makes his way back out into the city streets. As he made his way down the street towards the town square, he noticed a group of children at play between the bridges that connected the town center to the east and west sections of town. The children were playing with sticks in the rain. It seemed they were playing the roles of adventurers while stomping about in the puddles of water on the ground and making sound effects with their mouths of combat and magic. The young, thieving man watched the children play with a smile on his face as he found a bench to sit at nearby. It was only after a few minutes of observation that the small group of children noticed him watching them. They stopped their playing for a moment, and in a quick movement, they dropped their sticks and ran towards him. Mr. Sat! A few of the children shouted as they darted towards him. Sat rose to his feet quickly as the children ran up to him, some of the girls in the group giving him a hug while a few of the boys smiled up at him with eager eyes. Hey guys, you keeping out of trouble? We're starting it. Sat says with a heartwarming smirk on his face. We're keeping good, Mr. Sat, one boy says as some of the other kids giggled delightfully. Sat took a moment to see the faces of each of the children as he were a schoolmaster taking attendance of the class. Where is Arn? Sat asks one of the older boys standing nearby with a mild concern, but not losing his big slender smile. He's behind the bench near where we were playing. He doesn't look so well, Mr. Sat. The boy says with a mildly confused look on his face. Oh no, guys. Perhaps we should see how he's doing. Sat says as he carefully moves past the boys and girls surrounding him as he makes his way to the other side of the pavilion, seeing a small boy lying on his side on the wet ground. As Sat turns to see the child behind the bench, his demeanor shifts to becoming slightly tense. Aaron, you okay, buddy? Sat says calmly as he approaches the young boy. There is only a groan in response, but not much else that came out from the pale, skinned, red-headed little boy. The kids slowly begin to crowd around Sat as he uses his arms to keep them back. Sat then moves closer to the boy, kneeling down in a puddle to help pull the small child into an upright sitting position on the ground. Upon observation, he noticed the child looked pale, and it was obvious he was starved. He seemed very weak, and the child could barely look him in the eye. Hey guys, why don't you go play over there by the East Bridge for a while? Sat says to the children, turning to them as most of the children responded, giggling as they ran off. Only one other child stood there, unwavering at the request asked of him. Is Aaron gonna be okay? A small, dark-skinned boy asked with a worried tone as he seemed to be upset seeing his friend in such a condition. Oren's gonna be just fine, bud. He just needs some rest and, uh... Sot pauses as he lifts Oren up into his arms, holding him like a large baby. And a little bit of food wouldn't hurt either. He adds confidently as he smiles. Go on, go play! He adds. The child slowly walks towards the other children, looking back only for a moment, and then back to the group of children. So, Oren, you hungry, buddy? Sot asks almost playfully. The child just lets out a singular moan in response. Yeah, I'm a bit famished myself, but you, good sir, deserve a feast fit for a tiny king, he says as he begins to walk towards the north end of the town center main pavilion. He came to a building that had a large sign on it, though it was hard to read in the rain as the rain came down harder. Sat knew, however, that it was the town's only inn. He opened the door with his free hand, holding Aaron with only his right hand, and used his left hip to push the door the rest of the way open. Buying costumes only! 
a high-pitched little balding man said as he was busy penning the inn's ledger on a small wooden desk located no more than ten feet or so from the front of the door. The little bald man finally took a moment to look up and added, Oh, it's you, Sot. I know you're good for it. He says, chuckling, not seeming to take much notice to the child in his arms as he comes around from the desk. Yeah, turtle, I'm good for it. He says as he uses his back to shut the door and gives himself a moment for his eyes to adjust to the dim candlelit inn. Looks like another sick one, Dirtle says as he uses his small black shirt to wipe the ink from his fingers. Yeah, it's Dolan's kid Aaron this time, Sot says as he slowly moves to the counter to set the boy up on it. Dirtle made his way back towards a chest located on the left side of the hall from where the front door was. He quickly dug through the chest, pulling out a brown wool blanket as he made his way to Aaron, putting it around the boy's shoulders. Poor lad! Poor father, too! Ever since those barbarous pirates made provoke the little camp, it would seem that they have grounded every sailor in these parts, even a masterful helmsman such as yourself. No work means no food means sick people means... Well... <laughs> Dirtle grumbles a little as he walks to the other side of the desk and moves the inn's ledger in front of Sot. Yeah, the amount that they're demanding sailors and travelers to pay is absolute insanity, especially since a huge chunk of Mount Durger slid into the strait blocking our ships from the rest of the outside world. Now these pirates are stuck here, in the inner sea, with no one to take them out, and nowhere for them to go. They've been here for almost a year now. Sot says as he pens in his name and the child's name into the ledger. Cornelia should be here to deal with this nonsense. People starve and dying in the street. Murdered by bloody damn pirates. Dirtle says as he signs the book. Sot pulls out a few gold coins from his back belt pouch and sets them on the desk. Yeah, Cornelia should be doing a lot of things. But alas, they're not. So we have to make do with what we got till we can figure something out. Sot says as he ruffles Aaron's hair a little bit, making sure he is awake and aware, but still trying to be playful and keep him from worrying. So food and a bed for the lad, I take it? Dirtle asks as he slides the ledger to the side of the desk away from the wet boy. The works, old man. Bed, bath, food, laundry. Let him rest up and get better for a few days. Sot says as he looks over at the boy with a big wide grin. Hey, so it shall be done. I take it you don't want a two-single bedroom? Dirtle asks as he turns behind him, looking for a room key. Nope. I'll take your dusty old couch in the closet you call a billiard room. <laughs> he replies, chuckling a bit as he picks the boy back up. You know I'd let you sleep here for free if you did some work around here. Dirtle says, scratching the small brownish-gray bristles of facial hair with his index finger. Yeah, I know. But then who would sleep on your dusty billiard room couch and play countless hours of darts? I mean, in all fairness, no one has used that fancy dartboard you had custom made since you bought it. So perhaps if someone sees it getting used, then perhaps you'd get some more people come in and spend in coin here. Sot replies as he takes the room key from Dirtle and makes his way towards the small staircase leading to the second floor. Perhaps they'd play if there wasn't a freeloader sleeping on the couch in me billiard room. <laughs> Dirtle shouts in a silly and sarcastic tone as he laughs loudly. Sot carefully made his way to the top of the steps as he saw a hall with only four doors in it. He could tell that Dirtle gave him his favorite single bedroom, the room that has a window into an alley beside the inn. Regardless, he made his way down the hallway and used the key to open the door and pressed his body against the door to push it open. There was a single bed and nightstand in the room with a simple dresser with a few drawers. The room was not too small, enough room for the bed to be against the center back of the room opposite the door, with a window on the north wall. Slowly and carefully, Sot set the boy down on the bed and left the big wool blanket wrapped around him. He smiled at the child for a moment and reached back into his leather pouch to pull out what looked like an apple. He juggled it for the boy for about a minute, and then kneeling beside the boy, he took the apple and began to balance it and spin it around on, the, on his right index finger. Suddenly stopping the apple, he held it out to the boy, who took it with a wobbly, weak arm. Eat it slowly, Aaron. Dirtle's missus will be up here in a bit to take you your clothes and clean you up. This should hold you till they can get a good meal ready for you. 
Sat says with a confident and strong-willed voice. Papa and Mama are gone. Aran says, just blankly staring at the apple. I know they are, bud. Just try to get well and take care of yourself. Keep warm, my friend, and you'll be out playing again in no time. Sat says to Aaron, putting a hand on top of his head. The boy unable to respond, even with a grin or smile, because he was just too weak. He backed away towards the door as he opened the door and softly closed the door behind him, finding himself out in the hallway. As he slowly made his way down the hallway, he stopped for a moment. It was clear he was trying to remain calm and collected, but it was no use. He found himself leaning against the wall of the hallway and sliding down it till he was seated on the cold wooden floor. His legs stretched out till he reached the other side of the hallway. His hands were covering his face as he began to sigh heavily in defeat by himself, unable to hold back a few tears out of sadness and frustration. Even though it was midday outside the inn where he left Arryn, it was still raining and almost all light was covered by the clouds in the sky as rain poured down onto the ground relentlessly. Sot had wiped the tears from his eyes and took a deep breath as he looked about the town. Less people had populated the streets even though he figured the streets would be far busier by now. It was a strange sight as he took a moment to slowly scan his surroundings. As it seemed no one was nearby, he slowly took a few steps off from the porch of the inn and began to make his way across the western bridge of the town square, with a desire to pick up another apple or two at the market near the west waterway. Still being observant, Sot continued making his way west, and then taking the first street south that was lined with residential domiciles and a few small businesses like a notary and a small armorsmith, until he came to an abandoned grocery cart. The food was still sitting there on the cart. Apples, oranges, radishes, and more. Yet, no one was working it. Strangely enough, there seemed to be no one around, either. As he took a few moments to look about the street, he noticed a lot of the shutters on the windows were closed, and the shop doors were shut with signs showing closed on them. Strange to be closed during the middle of the day, unless something was going down. Sot thought out loud as he started to feel suspicious of the situation. He heard the voice of a woman cry out in anger off in the distance, though what was said was undecipherable. It was followed by the sound of gruff and gritty laughter, not in synchronization and not in the same pitch. He knew they were pirates, just from their laughter, and that there were at least three of them. He made his way down to the end of the road to find an entrance into a nearby alley, Following the sounds of hoarse and poorly articulated banter, as every moment or so, the woman could be heard shouting words of resistance back. Stay back from me, you repulsive, shaggy-haired dullards, and keep your grubby hands off me! The woman shouted. She was swinging back and forth at them with what looked like a mallet or large hammer defensively as she was backed into the corner of the alley. She wore a snow-white robe with small red triangles located around the openings of her face, hands, and bottom that clung to her feminine frame as Sot noticed that puberty was incredibly kind to her hips and chest. Yet, in this weather, it was obvious that she was soaked to the bone. To no surprise, he noticed that she was surrounded by three pirates. They wore matching blue and white striped shirts as one of them had a red bandana covering the entire top of his head. Only the pirate with the red bandana was armed with a large curved blade that was exposed since it was only secured to his body by a crummy red tattered sash wrapped around his waist. The other two pirates were each trying to move in on the poor woman trapped in the corner, equally reaching out to grab her, then pull away when the hammer got too close. The pirate with the bandana could be seen sifting through what looked like a small satchel in his hands and randomly pocketing items and what looked like gold every second or so while looking up from pilfering as if keeping an eye out. No wood we have here, the pirate with the red bandana says as he pulls out what looks like a black stone. I don't know, boys. Looks like a black stone. One of the other pirates says as he comes over towards Boris to take a closer look at it. Boris holds it up to the sky as he tries to look at it closer, seeing a very murky transparency of black and blue. 
Don't you dare touch that, you mugger, you! The woman calls out as she lunges towards boards with her hands reaching out to grab the black crystal in his hands. It was in a quick motion, but the third pirate, keeping her at bay, unleashes a strong right hook as he punched the woman in the face, knocking her to her knees. Looks like you need to know your place, girly. And that place is me foot against your face. Boris says, taking the crystal and pocketing it as he lifts his right leg up slowly, a large menacing grin on his face. All right, all right, all right, Sot says, calling out to the three pirates, getting their attention as Boris lowers his foot and the three pirates turn towards Sot. Don't you think stealing from an innocent woman is beneath such savvy sailors such as yourselves? Well, mighty, she was about to be beneath me when I put me boot to her pretty little face. Bor says, drawing his cutlass as he tucks the crystal into a small pocket on his canvas pants. The two other pirates chuckle mildly as they pull out small daggers that they had hidden in their pants' waistline. Now, now, we don't have to resort to such violence. Just give the lady your stuff back so I don't have to embarrass you guys in front of her. Sot says confidently as he flashes a bright and brilliant gl grin on his face. The two dagger-wielding pirates begin to move towards Sot, but are stopped by boars. Oi, go this stringy little morsel, mates. Keep your eyes on the lass. He says as he shoves the satchel onto the pirate to his right and slowly edges his way towards Sot with his sword held casually at his side. Oh no, tough guy here. Look out, boys and girls, the wee little pirate is armed and dangerous. <laughs> Sot says, mimicking a pirate accent mockingly as he crosses his arms and chuckles a little. You think you're funny, do ya? You? you won't be laughing with me sword in your belly. Boar says as he lunges towards Sot with his cutlass only to hit air and rainfall. Sot had quickly dodged to the right side without the pirate noticing his swift movement. He then slashes horizontally at Sot, and again he missed as he noticed Sot crouched down below the blade. Then he slashed downward and his sword crashed against the stone street for a third time missing its mark as Sot had rolled backwards away from the strike. If you swing your sword any slower, I might have to start taking naps between attacks. <laughs> Sot says chuckling as he slowly rose to his feet. Boars let out an agitated growl as he assaulted Sot with a flurry of sword slashes and thrusts, each one of them being easily evaded by Sot as he continued to laugh and make one-liner mockeries towards Boars. After several attempts to hit Sot, Boars began to let out sighs and groans of exhaustion, his swings becoming even slower. In one quick move, Sot dodged the downward sword slash as he skipped behind Boars, with his dagger and sheath then in his hand. With a quick backward swing of his hand, he clubbed Boars in the back of the head with the heavy rear bolster of his dagger, knocking Boars to the floor as his sword fell to the ground and away from him. In a quick motion, Sot began to twirl the dagger in his right hand as it spun quickly around and around in a mesmerizing dance of steel blade and wooden tang as he finally brought the blade back down into its sheath. Looking up towards the two other pirates, he reached out towards them with his right hand, his palm to the sky, and his fingers motioning them tauntingly to come at him. The two pirates backed up slowly, one of the pirates dropping the satchel on the ground as they both readied their knives. One of the pirates jumped forward to attempt to slash Sot, but before he could even swing his arm, Sot grabbed the pirate's knife-wielding arm with one hand and his head with the other hand, and used his momentum to smash the pirate's face against the right brick wall of the alley as the pirate instantly dropped to the floor like a rock. And then there was one, Sot says as he looks back towards the last pirate with a snarky grin on his face, though the pirate was not where he was last seen. He was pulling the woman up from the ground and hiding behind her, his knife to her face. The woman, still stunned by the massive right hook she took earlier, begins to whimper as she tries to fight off the pirate only to realize that she had a weapon held close to her face. The pirate pulls back her hood, exposing her face clearly as he pressed the side of the knife against her right cheek as he held her body close to his with his left hand. I'll cut the wench if you try any funny business. Now you, walk! The pirate says as he jerks his head, signaling for Sot to leave. I knew pirates were scumbags. But I never thought I'd meet a pirate who is a complete coward to hold a woman hostage. 
Sat says, poking fun at him as he stood almost completely still. I'm a bloody pirate, you goody two-shoes. To me holding a lass hostage is easy pickings. The pirate says, laughing a bit as he backs up against the wall, pulling the woman with him. It was incredibly subtle, almost unseen, as Sayat's right hand that lay rested at his side rubbed up against the side of his surcoat ever so slightly, his hand seeming to grip something hidden from view of the pirate. Last chance, you pathetic little galley slave. Let her go. Sat says, the smile from his face gone as his head turns only slightly to the right, his right eye seeming to focus on the pirate. Kill me a galley slave, you scrawny little fuck! <coughs> the pirate said only to be interrupted with a quick jerking of his head backwards and the back of his head hitting the wall behind him. The woman had blinked, but noticed Sat's right hand was fully extended, a stern look on his face. She pulled away from the pirate, who was slowly sliding down the back of the alley wall, a throwing knife splitting his face right between the eyes, the knife inserted into his head down to the steel thin handle. As the woman noticed the blood dripping from between the pirate's eyes, she quickly backed away against the left wall as Sot made his way towards her, picking up her satchel along the way. You're safe now, milady, Sot says, hinting with a small amount of charm as he holds out her satchel. The woman was flustered a bit, her wet brown hair blocking some of her face as she tried to think of any words to respond with. Thanks, was all she uttered out, still seeming in mild shock from her hostage situation as she was trying hard to collect herself. It was then when the sound of footsteps echoing through the alley rang out as Sot turned to see Boars in full sprint. Captain! Captain! Boars shouted as he ran off and out of sight onto the main street as he headed north. He had a thicker skull than I thought. We have to get out of here, Sot says as he reaches out and takes the woman by her hammer-free hand and pulls her along. The woman did not argue as she felt she could trust Sot for now, as she and him began to ran back out into the street. Her and Sot ran as fast as they could as they passed the grocery cart as well as the armor. As quickly as their feet could carry them, they made their way across the western bridge as they could hear the sounds of loud footsteps, many of them, trampling the stone street from across the eastern bridge. In that moment, Sot realized fleeing the town may be their only option, as all other options most likely led to death. We have to get out of town, now! Sot says as he stops in the town square, frantically keeping his eyes on the lookout for the mob of pirates that are most likely heading their way. I will not leave without my crystal! The woman says, shouting at Sot and forcefully pulling her hand away from him. Lady, it's your crystal or your life, Sot says with an austere look on his face. Then my life is forfeit. I will not leave without it, she says as she begins to back away from Sot. She was clearly upset, and he could tell that she was too stubborn to listen to reason. In the distance, he could hear the rabble of pirates nearly reaching the East Bridge. Fine, we'll get it back, but we have to hide, Sot says as he swiftly moves up closer to her. His voice, a slightly loud whisper as he puts his left arm around the back of her waist to move her along as they quickly move through the town square and arrive back at Dirtle's Inn. As they both rush through the front door, Sat quickly pushed the woman onto the floor and closed the door behind him, reaching up to the locking mechanism made of wood and metal and latching the door shut, his back pressed against the back of it. He then pulled the woman close to him, both arms around her as he tried to hold her still and his soft voice shushing her. The sound of angry pirates could be heard calling out and yelling. A few individual pirates could be heard banging on doors. And for unfortunate denizens, the ones that were unlocked were flung open and two or three pirates entered each home in the town square. Sot and the woman were silent and motionless as they heard the loud bang on the door behind them. They didn't say a word or move a singular muscle. The door banged loudly again as the shadows of men could be seen from the windows as they peered into the inn. Another loud bang at the door blasted out as Sot could feel the woman breathing faster and heavier. He took that moment to take a deep breath as his stomach was against her back. He slowly, and with over-exaggerated movement, tried to use the tempo of his breathing to slow hers down and keep her calm. After about a minute of loud banging on the door, her breath slowed down and her body became more relaxed. Finally, after another minute or two, the banging stopped and the sound of the mob became more distant and more faint. What did you do this time, Sat? Dirtle says angrily, peeking out from behind his little disc. You know me, Dirtle. 
picking fights in broad daylights. Sot says with a big smirk on his face. You can't be making sense of those words rhyming like that, you idiot. Dirtle says as he makes his way over to Sot and the woman on the floor, offering the woman a hand up. Slowly, the woman rises to her feet, giving a small nod to the crusty old Dirtle who helped her up. Well, at least we're safe for now, Sot says as he slowly shuffles to his feet. I must get that crystal back, the woman says, a harsh look of determination in her eyes. Whoa, whoa now. In due course, of course. What is your name, mademoiselle? Sot asks, trying to be overly polite. I'm Flo, a white mage from Crescent Lake. I take it you're Sot. What are you, some kind of thief? She asks roughly as she doesn't feel like playing introduction games and Sot has done more than enough pushing around to get on her bad side. I'm uh, uh, unemployed at the moment, <laughs> Sot replies as he chuckles a bit. Well, thank you for your help. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to get my crystal back. Flo says as she readies her hammer and makes her way towards the door. Wait, wait, wait. You can't go back out there. Those pirates will skin you alive doing God knows what's to you. Sot says as he quickly sidesteps in front of the door. I don't have time to play games with you. Let me pass. Flo says as she angrily takes a step back, seeing deep anger in her eyes. It was clear that she was not angry at Sot, but at the pirates and the scenario presented before her. Flo didn't seem to care about the ramifications of going back and confronting those men, but she felt that she had to do herself and her family proud and get the crystal back. Look, I hope you get the darn thing back, okay? Just, uh, why is it so important to you? I mean, a crystal that is pitch black isn't worth a lot. Sot says as he holds up his hands in surrender, just in case Flo decides to crack him over the face with her wooden mallet. I was summoned to Cornelia to bring that crystal to the king. That worthless black crystal belonged to my mother when she risked her life to come to Crescent Lake. It is priceless to me, and it is my responsibility to get it back. Again, I thank you for your help, Sot. But I must retrieve what belongs to me, and I don't need some dashing rogue playing hero to help me. Flo says as she tries to move past Sot, who is playfully blocking the door and preventing her from leaving. If I might chime in, Flo was it? Sot here knows the ins and outs of this city far better than anyone. There is no one with more nimble fingers and able to hide in the most shallow of shadows than that young man. Dirtle says as he makes his way back to his desk and picks up some of the fallen parchments that fell on the floor when he hid. Besides, Flo... These bastard pirates take all their loot and store it in the hull of their ship. I used to be a helmsman before these pirates came and shut down the port. I know my way around a ship as well as how to get in without being seen. I'll get your crystal back for you. I swear. Sot says with a serious look in his eyes that was polar opposite of his playful demeanor earlier. I'm going with you. Flo says as she crosses her arms stubbornly. Just as long as you stay out of my way and hide somewhere safe. We need to wait till things settle down with the pirates, so it might be an hour or two before we can make our move, Sot says as a soft grin grows back on his face. A handful of ships could be seen out in the port as the gangways were guarded by heavily armed pirates. Up and down the streets surrounding the piers were small units of guards patrolling the docks as many of them were preparing the lanterns as the sun began to set beat red through the rainy overcast sky. Shadows of ship and building alike made the rain-soaked street seemingly covered in a thin blanket of darkness, with patches of light coming into view along with motions of the ship swaying with the waves of the water beneath them. Sot and Flo were almost completely covered in the shadows of a narrow alley between two buildings no more than four feet wide. Across the street from them was a large Karak vessel, its fore and aft castles were tall and towering as the large curve on both sides led to the main deck of the ship that seemed absent of crew. The ship was tied at the bow and stern of the ship with some spring lines between them, preventing the tall ship from swaying heavily among the waves. On the dock were rain-soaked cleats that were tied to the large, heavy ropes holding the ship in place. Through some of the windows of the ship, dim candlelight could be seen flickering, but no presence of anyone at all. Is that a pirate ship? Flo asked, looking at the massive size of it. Strangely enough, no. That is an old warship and was converted into a merchant vessel. 
Pirates have big mouths, and they have been using this ship as a place to store their loot. Must not have been enough room on their schooner. Sot whispers as he doesn't take his eyes off the ship or the patrolling pirates. A few moments went by in silence as he went as carefully making observations on the pirate patrols and the various sights upon the ship before them. Are you sure the crystal's on that ship? Flo says with skepticism in her voice as she looks at, at the narrowed eyes of Sot as he did not look at her and kept his eyes looking out upon the port. Yeah, it is the only ship with no other pirates on it. One thing is for sure, that pirates don't trust anyone, not even each other. So I take it that there are only a few guards below deck, guarding the hold, as none of the other ships have light coming from the windows. Sot says as he continues to keep his gaze fixed on the entire port, as his eyes move from ship to ship and from patrol to patrol. Are you not going to go and get my crystal back? Flo asks after about a minute or so of silence had gone by, her patience and her nerves wearing thin. In due course, of course. You don't just jump into a den of murders, rapists, and thieves without an in plan and an out plan. Sot says as he finally turns back to Flo with a slightly arrogant grin on his face. A what and a what plan? Flo says as she looks annoyed at Sot not understanding his slang commentary. You stay here. Time for me to initiate my in plan. Sot says as he slinks out into the shadows in the streets. His timing was quick and seemed almost flawless as he moved along the wet street out to the pier. He quickly and easily, silently under the blanket of pouring rain, found himself out of sight behind a large cleat that the large ship was tied to. Flo could no longer see him as she saw two patrolling pirates slowly make their way past the cleat and further down the dock. Awkwardly, she could see Sot's head pop up from behind the cleat, like a prairie dog peeking out from his den, as he then disappeared behind the cleat again. She had lost track of him for several moments, worried that he had vanished or was caught out of sight. Upon closer examination, she could finally see him up high on the large rope that tied the ship from the bow to the cleat on the dock, shimmying himself up the rope and pausing once in a while in the presence of any pirate patrols moving past the cleat where he began his climb. Holding her breath as she watched him climb up the rope, she let out a massive sigh of relief seeing the silhouette of him leaping from the rope and onto the deck of the ship. The dock was barren of pirates as only barrels, ropes, crates, and other ship-like apparatus could be seen tied down and stored in various nooks and crannies of the ship. The motion of the ship seemed to be mild as Sot quickly and carefully made his way across the deck towards the aft castle in which he saw stairs leading up to the wheel of the ship and the third mast at the back of the ship. Below the balcony of the aft castle was what seemed to be two sets of double doors and a small covered stairwell leading down into the belly of the ship. The sounds of rough laughter and the talking of sea scruffy voices could almost barely be heard over the sound of the pouring rain as Sot carefully and slowly made his way downstairs. He found himself in a corridor surrounded by wood planking and adorned with small lit lanterns swaying from the ceiling with the motion of the ocean. Slowly and cautiously, Sot made his way down the hall carefully walking past the handful of closed doors and leaning against the door's opposing walls to keep his shadow from being seen under the gap between the door and the floor. Listening out for the voices he heard, he found himself moving closer and closer towards the scruffy voices as one of the doors in the hallway was left open. Inside the room, two muscular and gruff pirates sat as they chattered among themselves over a game of liar's dice. Fortunately, they were not fully facing the opening of the door, as Sot quickly skipped past the door once he noticed the two men peeking at their dice from under their cups, not making a single sound. Continuing down the corridor, he found a door that was curiously locked up tight with a simple padlock. Sot knew this is where they were hiding their loot, and getting past this simple lock would not be a challenge at all. Reaching into his vest, he pulled out two metal rods of his lockpicking kit and began to slide them into the padlock. After a few moments and the altering of the lock's tumblers, 
The padlock opened as he slowly pulled the padlock off the chain and quietly laid the lock on the floor and rigged the chain holding the door shut to seem like it was upright. Inside the lit room were mounds and chests full of gold jewelry paintings, silver Lufinian artifacts, and baubles stacked up around the room's walls. The back wall was nothing more than a large window showing the pier and many of the buildings of Provoca whose lights were out. A large table sat at the center with gemstones piled atop them and a pair of jeweler's glasses with multiple lenses sat on the center of the table. On the far left side of the table, not one, but two black crystals laid on a piece of cloth side by side as if separated from the mass of colored rocks on the other side of the table. As he made his way around the table, he took a moment to study both crystals closely, as he had trouble telling them apart. Trying to figure out the differences between the crystals, he slowly held both of them up to the light, one in each hand. He could see that one of them had a hue of dark blue, but the other crystal had a hue of deep forest green. Not knowing which one belonged to Flo, the easiest solution was obvious, to take them both. He quickly stashed them away in a pouch on his belt as he could hear some commotion coming from the hallway as he took a moment to try and listen in. A few seconds of awkward silence passed as he had a feeling the jig might be up as he begins to scout the room for places to hide or escape. He could hear footsteps begin to approach the door of the treasure room as he knelt beat down behind the table. The door flung open with a loud thud as a massive pirate ducked under the door frame as he entered the room. Sot quietly kept out of sight, but knew the room had no other hiding spots than behind the simple wooden table and in its own shadow. The large pirate made his way across the room, examining the mounds of treasure to see if anything was disturbed. As he made his way to the table, Sot slowly moved to the far side of the table, and as the pirate came to the back side, he moved to the front side, hiding on his hands and knees, keeping out of view of the burly yet oblivious pirate. As Sot rounded the table, he found himself closer to the door. He knew that he could make a break for it, as he was sure that the large pirate, though muscular and massive, would be too slow to run him down. As he turned to run, he found himself bouncing off the muscular, firm, and sweaty chest of another pirate that was playing dice earlier that he had forgotten about. The large pirate, towering over Sot, grabbed him by his coat collar and called out, Go to little thief, here we elves. <laughs> the pirate says, laughing loudly as he captures the attention of the other pirate on the other side of the room. Got a pain in the leg, Sot says without hesitation, taking advantage of the fact that the giant pirate didn't restrain Sot's arms when he had the chance. He reaches into his coat and pulls out a throwing knife and jams it into the pirate's thigh, causing him to let Sot go. Quickly, Sot looks towards the treasure mound to find a golden chalice resting in one of the chests with a few coins covering the base. He grabs the chalice and throws it as hard as he can at the window across the room, shattering the glass as he darts forward, quickly dodging the other pirate who reached out for him as he approached the open window. Jumping onto the windowsill, Sot quickly reaches to the top of the window frame outside the ship and lifts himself above it, trying to climb out of reach of anyone trying to grab him inside the ship. In a swift shuffle, he made his way away from the broken window as he moved carefully along the window frame, trying not to let the rocking of the ship make him slip. When he was clear of the broken window, he reached into his coat to pull out more throwing knives as he began to jam them into the side of the ship, one at a time. Four blades later, he was able to create a means to climb up the side of the ship, trying to get back onto the deck before his assailants knew where he was headed. He could see that one of the pirates spotted him as they leaned out of the broken window, and the pirate tried to throw a small hatchet at Sot only to miss completely. As the young thief found himself back on the deck of the ship, he could hear the sound of pirates running up the gangplank as they probably heard the commotion of the window breaking and the guards shouting in a complete rage. Quickly, Sot looked about the boat for a rope or chain, anything he could use to help him get off the ship quickly. It was on the ground, between a barrel and covered brass cannon, that he could see three sets of heavy iron shackles in a pile on the deck floor. Grabbing one of the pairs, he slipped out onto the large rope 
holding the ship in dock, and he quickly flipped the shackles atop the rope. He could hear the rushing of footsteps behind him, and without looking back, he grabbed each end of the shackles and used them to slide down the docking rope away from the ship as he let out a loud and victorious Yahoo! that echoed through the streets. With a big smile on his face and without hesitation, he landed onto the pier as he darted towards the dark alley where Flo was waiting. Without a single thought, he grabbed Flo's arm and began to pull her along. Flo was completely caught off guard as she could see a bunch of large shadows blocking the side of the docks behind her as Sop pulled her along through the alley and back onto the main road where they made their way north, trying to reach the western bridge to get back to the town center. Soon, with a horde of pirates trailing several yards behind them, they found themselves on the main street leading to the bridge as Sop took a moment to check if the path west and east were both clear. Unfortunately, he looked to the west and saw Boars standing about 50 yards away talking with what looked like a tall man wearing a tricorn hat on his head and seemed armed with two large bladed cutlasses at his sides held on by a large plated leather belt. His doublet was a deep crimson red and his beard was black and oily. A single eye patch covered his left eye as his teeth were littered with gold caps glistening in the little bit of light that could be seen from the lanterns lining the walls of the street as the rain continued to pour downward harder. Sot knew that the pirate was none other than Captain Bika, leader of the pirate gang that infested Provoca. However, it wasn't the swashbuckling captain that concerned him as much as the 20 or so other pirates armed with swords, knives, and clubs closing in on him from behind. Slowly creeping east towards the bridge leading back to the town center, he pulled Flo to move with him quickly, trying not to be too obvious. Unfortunately for Sot, Captain Bika looked away from the snitching boars as he let out a wicked yell. Get him, lads, and bring me the girl alive! Captain Bika shouts, his voice harsh and raspy as he points towards Sot and Flo. Run, now! Sot shouts as he pushes her moderately as they begin to run towards the bridge. Sot realized that there was nowhere they could hide, not with Captain Bika and the majority of his crew chasing them down. Worst part is if he was actually caught, especially with the list of loot the pirates had on their ship in his pocket, they would probably skin him alive before hanging him from the ship's mast. They came up to the center of the bridge as Sot pulled on Flo's arm to stop her from running. Do you trust me? Sot asks as he grabs her shoulders to turn her towards him. He noticed her hair was out of her face and that she was quite beautiful with her small button nose and sweet brown eyes. No! Not a single bit, you lunatic! She shouts back as she looks back towards the stampede of pirates thundering towards them. Yeah, I wouldn't trust me either! He says as he pushes her with all of his strength, sending her over the side of the bridge and splashing down into the fast-flowing water below. He took a moment to peer out over the side of the bridge to watch her get swept away by the rushing water as she made her way south towards the large town walls of stone seen out in the distance. Sot looks back towards the rushing pirates as they were still several yards out of reach as he grew a big smile on his face. With a quick wave of his hand at the pirate mob, he then jumped out over the railing of the bridge as he fell down several feet into the cold water below and found himself being forced by the current of the water towards the southern gate as he swam moderately to keep his head above water. Yeah! <laughs> Sot shouted and laughed as he found the ride down the small waterway to be quite entertaining as the pirates stood at the edge of the bridge, none of them seeming to take the plunge to chase them. You lily liver scallywags! Can't any of you swim? Captain Bika shouts as he grabs Boars by the collar of his torn blue and white striped shirt. No, Captain. You killed Terry last week for cheating the cards. Boars says nervously as he cowers before the captain. Letting the shipmate go, he gripped the rail of the bridge and let out a furious and rage-induced yell as he suddenly grabbed Boars and tossed him over the bridge. However, unlike Flo and Sot, Boars banged his head violently against the stone bridge as he flipped over the rail and his lifeless body flowed down the waterway, with the sound of the other pirates mildly laughing and amusement trailing off into the distance. A pearl white moon was finally starting to peek out over the horizon as Flo and Sot continued to run for what felt like several hours and countless miles. 
The town was out of sight, and they were both heavily panting hard, trying desperately to suck in air as Flo began to stumble a bit and slide towards the grassy hillside as they both could only hear the sounds of their breathing and the sounds of a cold night. Sot stopped running, seeing that Flo fell behind and then slowly made his way back to her, his arms on top of his head as he tried hard to suck air into his body. You, Sot, are insane! Flo says as she finds a rock on the ground and throws it at him in frustration only to miss. No, no, no. No need to get angry. <laughs> Sot says, chuckling a bit as he was still full of energy and excitement. You could have killed me. And now I'm all wet and, and cold and... and. Flo says as she slowly rises to her feet, her fist clenched tight out of anger at Sot for the whole escapade he caused. All right already, I know. But you know what's important? He says as he reaches into his pouch and pulls out one of the crystals. I got your damn crystal back. He says as he takes her hand and softly places it in her hand. Flo took a moment to examine the crystal as it felt slightly different to her. In that moment, she held it up against the light of the moon and tried to examine it. This isn't my crystal. This this one is green. She says as she glares at Sot. Oh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> Here we go. He reaches back into his pouch, grabbing the other crystal, and quickly swaps the crystals before Flo could grasp down on the one he had accidentally gave her. Wait, give the other crystal back! I can't believe you found two of them! Flo says, crawling towards him, reaching out to get the crystal back from Sot. Hang on there, lady. I risked everything I am to get your crystal back. This sucker stays with me. He says as he tucks the crystal back into his pouch. I need that crystal, Sot! The King of Cornelia needs that crystal! She shouts at him angrily as she slowly and wearily gets back to her feet. Yeah, I know. You mentioned that. Well, I'm not parting with this crystal, and I have a feeling you will hunt me to the ends of the earth for this sucker, so here's the deal. I'll go with you to see the King, and perhaps he will reward me handsomely for this crystal. In the meantime, we head to Cornelia, and I'll keep my crystal safe, and you keep your crystal safe. It is a few days' journey from here to the Cornelian Border Bridge, and we wouldn't want any creepy crawlers to drag you off in the night. <laughs> also, there's a forest not far from here where we could camp, and I could get a fire started. We can't do it out in the open like this, with the pirates probably hunting us out in the hills. But don't worry, a little further, and we'll get you dried out in no time. Sat says as he turns his back to her and looks up at the full moon finally shining down on them. The overcast city of Provoca far behind them, as they both made their way northwest towards the dark sea of trees in the distance. And this was a chapter of a novelization of Final Fantasy. This is my first time ever creating a fan fiction, and on top of that, this is the first time I've ever narrated one out loud. I'm still learning how to do this, and hopefully appeal to some of you. Give it a thumbs up, comment, subscribe, give me good crit give me any criticism, good and bad, and uh, I will try to get the next episode out as soon as possible. Thank you guys for stopping by. We'll see you next time.